here we go. Right. Here we go. Daniel chapter three. So let's go through the summary real quick of uh, Daniel chapter two. Uh, keep in mind that this is the foundation of end time prophecies in the book of Daniel and Revelation. As we study, we'll peel back the onion, so to speak, to gain an understanding of the meaning of the statue and we'll relate what we see in Daniel to what we're going to see in Revelation and what we will see in Revelation. So Nebuchadnezzar has that disturbing dream. He calls for the three wise men and he can't remember the dream. He knows he had one. So he asked them to tell him what the dream was and then tell him the interpretation. They can't do either. And he called them the fakers <laughs> and yeah. apt name for them. Daniel and his friends, uh, uh, Daniel and his friends take this to God, and God reveals the dream to Daniel and its interpretation. Daniel tells the king, "There's a God in heaven who reveals secrets, and he made known to the king, and is, he has made known to the king." Nebuchadnezzar will be in uh, it the latter days. The history of the world is revealed before it happens, right down to the day and the return of Jesus. The dream is the foundation of end time prophecies in Daniel and the book of Revelation. You're going to see the statue again in Revelation 13. And then this is uh, the view from last uh, week that Eddie showed us. So here are the, the nations. And of course, that last one is the feet of iron and clay. And now let's have a look at Daniel 3. This is an overview and an introduction, if you will. This is what we're going to talk about. Now, Nebuchadnezzar has uh, the massive statue erected, and it's made of gold. He commands all the subjects to bow down to the statue when they hear the music. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego display the king's command, disobey rather, the king's command to bow down towards the gold idol when music's played. And there's going to be uh, revelation connections that we'll show you. The king has them thrown into the fir fiery furnace that's heated to its maximum. The king sees not three men, but four in the furnace. He calls the men out, and they're not affected by the fire at all. And therefore, the king decrees that no one will speak against Daniel's God. Now, before we get started, what do you suppose Nebuchadnezzar was thinking when he was given the names of those kingdoms that would follow his, the Medes and the Persians will overthrow Babylon. And this, this nation state that is far to the West called Rome is going to overthrow the Greeks. I mean, I can't imagine what he was thinking when he was told that. And in uh, Revelation 13, we're going to see verse 15, and we're going to see it here in just a moment. And let's just go to that now, getting right into Revelation. So the summary of Daniel 2 again, of course, is the, the stone. Nebuchadnezzar's dream in chapter 2, the king acknowledges Daniel as Daniel's God as a God of gods in Daniel 2, 46 and 47. His mindset's changed. At least he acknowledges our God. The king learns the dreams and how it ends, but he didn't like it. Here is mentioned a kingdom that will never be destroyed. Of course, we know the kingdom, the kingdom of God. So the stone represented here is Jesus, and the stone destroys all the kings and kingdoms of the earth and replaces them with a kingdom that will never be destroyed. And now we get into Daniel chapter 3. So the king's tune changed, of course, when... Uh, when he saw the, uh, when he heard the, the dream. And now 23 years has passed between the time that the dream was translated by Daniel in chapter two and the events of chapter three. How long was that, uh, Larry? 23 years. 23 years. That's a pretty good uh, time between that fantastic dream and uh, what, what's happened here. That's right. So the so, king is so you, so you think about the uh, you know at the end of Daniel two, 
we have a king who appears to be converted, if you will, right? He yeah. appears to have appears said, to oh, I now see the light. Uh, your God is the God of gods. Everyone, let's worship him. And now 23 years later, we see him coming up with uh, his own version of the image, which he had seen, and seems to have veered off the course. Right? Yes, that's right. It took them a while to build that image. To build that statue yeah that's for sure because it's not a little one <laughs> the, reason so, I, the reason i bring that up is because i think we as christians need to be wearful or, or be aware of these things when you know time has passed sometimes we start looking for other ways to interpret things and maybe change things around in our minds and maybe maybe some of the scripture we don't like we sort of rephrase it so we like it better right yeah good point and, and maybe Nebuchadnezzar, too, was thinking about if I make it out of gold, we won't have to worry about the clay uh, being broken in the feet, perhaps. So the king is like many, as Charlie said, after an exciting, exciting revelation of God and the passage of time, soon forget and even doubt the sovereignty of our creator. An experience with God is a continual growing journey, not a destination per se. We must learn to continue with God every day, excitement and high spiritual experiences or not. Otherwise, our tune will change too. It is possible that the king will not, was not born again, as Charlie mentioned. He simply had an experience with God, but didn't go any further. Yeah, one other thing. Um, the king didn't like the fact that he was the head of gold and would be followed by an inferior kingdom represented by the Medes and the Persians. So he, this uh, golden, so what, what do you think having this whole statue of golden, he, what's he trying to say here? <laughs> yeah. Mine, mine, mine. His yeah. last ditch yeah. effort to try to change the future. Yes. Yeah, he's saying right. my kingdom will never end because I'm That's gold right. all the way. Yeah. Yep, exactly. <laughs> now, and uh, this is a reminder from John just acknowledging that God is a true creator of the universe is not enough. Jesus says we need to be born again or we cannot see and enter the kingdom of God. James explains this real faith, explains that real faith produces obedience from James chapter two. He says, but someone will say, you have faith, I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God, you do, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. But do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? That, of course, from James chapter 2, verses 18 through 20. So Nebuchadnezzar acknowledges Daniel's all-knowing God. The, he believed, but his actions in Daniel chapter 3 reflect that his heart was not really where it needed to be. Would someone like to read John chapter 3, verses 3 through 5? Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, Unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Amen. Thank you, Barbara. Now, Ezekiel 36, 26, he says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Does the rebirth mentioned in John that we just read fulfill Ezekiel's prophecy? When we are all in, in our spiritual rebirth, we are given a new heart and a new spirit. Our hard hearts are gone, and we are given a new heart of flesh through Christ. So I guess the logical question here would be, do we think Nebuchadnezzar was really converted? <laughs> exactly. That's really the question that we're asking here. Well, there is some evidence that he wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we're about to see that evidence, aren't we? Yeah, I think pretty soon we're going to see a little bit of the evidence as he burns down everyone's houses and crushes their families. That's right. 
you know, I wanted to show this photograph of the Ishtar gate from Babylon. So what you're looking at here is a gate from the city of Babylon that King Nebuchadnezzar certainly saw when he entered the city. And this now is rebuilt in the museum in Berlin. Have any of you ever got to see that mm -mm. in Berlin? So it's pretty amazing that that ancient gate being made of porcelain is still available for all to see. And I'd love to see that gate. Oh, gosh. Wow. All right. We're in Daniel chapter three, verse one and two. Who would like to ring, uh, read that for us? Nebuchadnezzar the king made the Im an image in gold, of gold whose height was 60 cubits and its width 60 cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dura in the provident lot. And the king Nebuchadnezzar sent word to gather together the satraps, the administrators, his governors, his counselors, treasurers, and the judges, and the magistrates, and all the officials of the providence to come to the dedication of the image which King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Thank you, Angela. So they, he built this massive statue that's 60 cubits tall, which is 90 feet, and six cubits wide, which is nine feet. And he's placed it on the plain of Dura, and he's invited all of the officials of the kingdom to come to the dedication of this statue. These are all the political uh, people of the kingdom here, if you'll notice. Governor, yeah. right. leaders, et cetera, judges. Yeah, so these are all the people who owe something to uh, Nebuchadnezzar. <laughs> They're likely yeah. right. That's right. So if this statue that he dreamed about was made of different materials that would eventually fail, the king decides to have a statue made of gold. Now this statue in the height of, it's the height of over a five story, it's more like an eight story building. And the officials of the kingdom are invited to the dedication of that statue. Now I had a, uh, this slide and I had pinpointed where an archeologist said that the plain of Dura was and Eddie questioned that, and rightfully so. I did a little bit more digging and found that they did find a base that could have been used for a statue of this size on the plain of Dura, but it doesn't tell us where that exactly is. Some say that the plain of Dura was actually in Babylon. Some say that it was south of Babylon. What we know is that it was there, this statue that Nebuchadnezzar built, and now we have an idea of where Babylon is in Mesopotamia. Of course, that's modern day Iraq. And I don't know if you can see my uh, cursor or not. But uh, anyways, you can see it circled there. There is Babylon. And that is Iraq. And if you go just south, just southeast of Ur, that is about Baghdad, as I recall from modern maps. And here's a representation of the statue itself. <laughs> now, uh, Daniel chapter three, three through six. So the satraps, the administrators, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces gathered together for the dedication of the image King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then a herald cried aloud, to you, is, it is commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that all at the time they hear the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, and psaltery, in symphony with all kinds of music, you shall fall down and worship the gold image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast immediately in the midst of a burning, fiery furnace." So Daniel and his companions have a choice here. Obey the king, bow down, worship the image, and live, or disobey the king and pay with a punishment that seems impossible to survive. They're facing a trial. How are they going to respond? 
Biblical worship of God involves submission of the mind to truth and not bowing to gods. The world likes to challenge us to go against our faith in many different ways. James tells us in James chapter 1, verses, verse 2, beginning at 2, he says, Consider it all joy, all joy, brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the resting, the testing rather of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its perfect result, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. James encourages us not to fail in our tests of faith. They're being tested. Their faith is being tested right here. And they've got two choices. And uh, one choice is to obey. And the other choice is to disobey and die. Hmm. I, thought it was, I thought it was to obey or to obey. Yeah, it was to obey or <laughs> To obey and die. <laughs> to I mean, obey and die. There was a, obey the king who set up his own religion, who set up his own god, and and yeah, and then there's a obey God and see what He does. That's see right. Yeah, I, th I think last night when we were talking about this. I'm going the the great thing about obeying God is that you have the opportunity to be a blessing to others and to be a blessing to the world. And uh, what a blessing these guys were to all of Babylon. I mean, he, they were able to witness uh, beyond what anyone could imagine, right? That everyone got to see this. This wasn't just the king like in Daniel 2 who got to say, oh, yeah, that's right. All these guys got to see the power of God. And unlike most of us, they got to see Jesus right up close. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, so by following, by being obedient, they were a, a blessed and they were a blessing. That's right. So their faith, they were wearing their faith for all to see. And we're going to see that here in just a moment. Who'd like to read these verses, 7 and 8? So at the time, when all the people heard the sound of the horn, flute, harp, and lyre, and <clears throat> symphony, with all kinds of music, all the people, nations, and languages fell down and worshipped the golden image which King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Therefore, at the time of the certain Sheldons came forward and accused the Jews. Ah, uh, we talked about this last evening when we covered these slides, uh, Eddie, Charlie, and I. And, and uh, yeah, there's some tattletales here. They're called the, the Chaldeans or Chaldeans. And uh, why do you suppose they, why do you suppose they told the king and accused the Jews that they hadn't bowed down. Well, well, I just want to set this up a little bit. I mean, these three were the ones who were with Daniel. They're witnesses to the original thing, right? And they were they were given high positions. They're actually running Babylon, the province of Babylon right now. Yeah. So look at that. And then, then you have all the other people who are under them. Ah, Jealousy. Jealousy, yes. Charlie's got it. That's what I perceive it to be anyways. You're going to see this also uh, re repeated in Revelation 13, 14. You're going to see a beast or a statue, if you will. You're going to see a representation of a God that the people are going to be directed to bow down to and worship. So as uh, we talked about repeat and expand we're going to see this repeated in revelation 13 and expanded further who were the chaldeans were the chaldeans that they were an influential and highly educated group of people there in babylon now they were also the they had planted the idea in the the king to require the people to do that to begin with to bow down when they heard all the instruments so yeah. now they're going, aha. <laughs> they didn't do it. They didn't do it. That's right. Well, and just, I want to see how different their response is. These are the people who are, I'm going to call them salvation by works people, by the way, because they're in works. If they do this, they know they're going to be saved somehow, right? And But on the other hand, here we have Daniel when he first is told that all the wise men are being killed. You know, he goes and tells his his boss, stop that. Don't kill them. You know, I'll, let me pray about this. 
And so he's actually concerned. He's not wanting to draw attention to the fact. He doesn't say those guys failed. Right. <laughs> he's right. actually trying to save them. So there's a slightly different characteristic, isn't it, between those people who are obedient to God. They're not going to be the tattletales. Yeah. But if you're not being, you're busy trying to show other people, hey, those guys aren't following the rules. Yeah, yeah. good point, Charlie. These, uh, these guys were probably uh, sucking up a little bit to King Nebuchadnezzar. You think? And, uh, of course, they had motivation, too, uh, in that they uh, were going to be thrown into the fiery furnace. Yeah. yeah, that's right. But, you know, doesn't it seem a small thing to bow down and worship this statue that's it's not alive anyways? I mean, the king would spare their lives if they did. Why make trouble for themselves? What do you guys think? To be the witness, stand up for what you believe in. Don't be a wishy-washy. Okay. They'd be wishy-washy if they, if they did bow down, wouldn't they? And they've got to face the real God, the God of uh, Abraham, Isaac, mm -hmm. and Jacob, if they don't. So what forbids them from worshiping this idol? I mean, where's it written? Where is it coming from? It didn't. Thou shalt not bow down thyself. You know, yeah. or worship any other gods. Okay. I like well, that. The Ten Commandments. But then also they had the relationship with God. You know, they studied, they trusted, they had a relationship. So out of love, too, I would assume they wouldn't do it. Ah, Amen. I like that. Yes. Amen. Amen. That's, uh, and that reminds us of, uh, for me, it reminded me of the faith of Abraham. Mm -hmm. He trusted God that God was going to provide that sacrifice, even though he was directed to tie up a, uh, Isaac. Now, uh, Exodus 23 through 6, that's what Barbara was talking about. You'll should, you should, shall have no other gods before me, not make any carved image, any likeness, or anything that is in heaven above or in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You should not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the inequity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. There's a connection between, uh, I think it was Angel or someone, talked about the love aspect and the keeping of the commandments. Uh, they, they love God and they didn't want to dishonor him. And uh, that's a good motivation for uh, obeying him. Yes, I, I agree. You know, I thought of something in, in looking at that and that in Daniel 1, it talked about Daniel had purposed in his heart. And I think you have to do that before you get into these kinds of situations where you don't want to have the debate at the time that you're being demanded to do something about, okay, what am I going to do? Yes. Oh. Good, good point, Cherie. Definitely. That, well, you know, a lot of it has to do with character, right? I mean, this is all character. This is, this, yeah, for them, for the three, this is automatic. They're not, they're not debating it. Let's, let's huddle. Let's talk about this. And they, know, they know it's automatic. It's in their character. Yeah, that's right. So it's uh, kind of like uh, army drills. You know, it, you have studied it, you have believed it for so long and done it that when the test comes, you're going to respond in the correct way. And that's what they did. Sounds yeah, like you know, uh, the, the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you know, they're, why would they even show up for um, this, uh, for, for this image? They had a, uh, they had a position. They had positions yeah, they were right. over. Right. That's that's the point. They had it, they had, almost had to be there. Yes. So it, that you would think that that would go against, uh, you know, showing up for something like this. But I think um, Cherie made a good point there. You have to purpose in your heart that wherever you are, you're not going to sin against God. That's right. So you might not be somewhere where you want to be. <clears throat> but because of your responsibility, you're there, but uh, you, you want to have a different attitude about things. It's my thought. Yeah, I agree. Mm -hmm. And we are, our character is challenged on a regular basis, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Maybe it's uh, cheating in taxes or, or things like that. 
So yes, I, I agree with Shuri as well. In uh, Psalm 16, 4, the sorrows, their sorrows shall be multiplied who hasten after another God. Their drink offerings of blood I will not offer, nor take up their names on my lips. So your sorrow will, sorrows will only be greater if you chase after another God, is what the psalm is telling us here. The author of this psalm says he will not make offerings to any God, nor will he ever use their name. And then we get to Psalm 135, 15 through 18. The idols of the nations are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they do not speak. Eyes they have, but they do not see. They have ears, but do not hear. Nor is there any breath in their mouths. Those who make them are like them. So is everyone who trusts in them. So what do we often worship instead of God? The psalmist alludes to that, material goods and wealth. Yeah. If ever there was a land that worshipped these things, it would be right here in the USA. Don't you agree? Yeah, I think when you start uh, putting anything uh, before uh, God, it becomes a God. Like, let's say that uh, your job, for example, is more important than God. And, and I'm not necessarily talking about going to church. I mean, it's a good thing to do, but uh, I, the experience of a Christian is a seven day a week thing. Um, and so maybe it's uh, automobiles or something that is made with hands. Um, that, that can become, uh, replace God. God needs to be number one in our life. I think that's what the first four commandments tell us, you know, not to have other gods. Well, too, I think, you know, humans make them, they, they don't have mouths, so you can't, they can't speak, they can't see, they can't hear, they don't breathe, so they're not alive, so what good is that God going to do for you if you're praying to them or worship, worshiping them? It's just empty, whereas God, our God, you know, he hears, he sees, he acts he's alive and and he's there for us these other things have no power yeah yeah evelyn just made a good point she said we serve a living god say amen to that amen, amen. yeah there's so hey, there's, you can make other people your idol also yeah. you know like your yeah. husband or your wife or your children anything that you put above god is considered mm -hmm. an idol yeah good point yeah. so it it can be an inanimate object like uh nebuchadnezzar's statue so there's no life in the material goods that we worship and if that is what we worship there is no life in us either according to the psalmist mm -hmm. that that's an in-your-face statement there's no breath in the mouth they are dead if they worship idols Whoa. and of course this one we know, Matthew 6, 24, no one can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to one and despise the other. You can't serve God and mammon. Mammon, of course, being money. Nothing needs to be added here, really, does it? I mean, we look at our money and think, I'm not worshiping it. What are signs that you may be worshiping your wealth? Not paying tithe, not giving offerings. Oh, okay, there's one or two <laughs> maybe make uh, finding it difficult giving all of your time to making money and not giving time to your community yeah there you go yet another not, not using your talents the way god intended you to use them okay there's yet another it's, it's those who trust in their wealth over trusting in god right if you're if you think you can solve all your problems, the bigger the bank account you have, and then, then of course, you end up worrying about your bank account, especially yeah. in times like these where your stock market's going crazy, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Do we have peace or are we worried? Well, if we're, with, if we're trusting in God, we have peace. Yes. Amen. Uh, this, this brings up probably, I don't want to get off on squirrel trail here, but 
First uh, <laughs> Timothy, and talks about the love of money is the root of all evil. <clears throat> you know, that's probably the most misquoted Bible verse that's out there. You know, the money has nothing to do with it. Just like you guys said, you know, these inanimate objects have nothing. It's what we put into those things that make them what they are. Amen. I definitely agree. So there's a real good lesson for us today from this Daniel chapter three about idols. In Leviticus 19.4, it says, do not turn to idols nor make for yourselves molded gods. I am the Lord your God. Right. And in Galatians uh, 4.8, but then indeed, when you did not know God, you served those which by nature are not gods. When we don't know God, this is when we are led to serve those things that are not of him. Now that Mary, we know, I think, uh -huh. Yeah, I'm sorry. I think of that verse. This is a really pretty powerful. When you, when you think that you do not know God, it's our privilege <clears throat> to know God. In fact, the uh, um, and I forget the exact passage, but it says, this is life eternal, <clears throat> but that they might know you, God the Father, is actually Jesus praying, <clears throat> and Jesus Christ in thy, thou hast sent. And then in another passage, um, again, I'm quoting without the, the reference, but I think you guys will remember, it says, let no man glory, but, but that he knows and understands me. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, power in knowing God, and the best way to know him is to learn of him, like Jesus said, uh, whether it's, um, you know, Bible study or serving him or whatever the case might be. Yeah. So if we know God, these things that we've worshipped in the past that were not of God should be in our rearview mirror and moving further and further from our view. Mm -hmm. Here's a test of knowing him. Now by this, we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. This verse continues and says something very straightforward, obey his commands. We had a study here a few months ago from uh, first, second, third John. And of course, those, all of those really lead us back to obedience. And that's where this one comes from. Here's yet another test of knowing him. He who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him. The division, this division among those who say they know him and those who don't can be found in whether they follow Jesus and obey him. And now we get to back to Daniel. 9 through 11. Who would like to read this one for us? I can. Okay. They spoke instead to King Nebuchadnezzar, O oh, king, live forever. You, O oh, king, has made a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the flute or the horn, the flute, the harp, the lyre, and the psaltery in symphony, in symphony with all kinds of music shall fall down and worship the gold image. And whoever does not fall down in worship shall be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery, fiery furnace. Okay, and here's that choice. Now I can imagine that our faith will be tested by future events in our lives, even if we don't live to see the end of the age. There are those in our nation who worship abortion as an example, as a right, and call it health care. There are those who worship Mother Earth rather than the one who created Earth. We are assigned the task of good stewardship of the Earth, but we were never given the task of worshiping Earth. A decree will be made in the final days regarding false worship. And let's look at Revelation 13, 15 through 17. Who would like to read that for us? I can read it. Okay, thank you. And it was given to him to give breath to the image of the beast, so that the image of the beast would even speak and cause as many as do not worship the image of the beast to be killed. And he causes all, the small and the great, and the rich and the poor, and the free men and the slaves, to be given a mark on their right hand 
or on their forehead. And he provides that no one will be able to buy or to sell except the one who has the mark, either the name of the beast or the number of his name. Okay. So the beast, an image, if you will, an image with breath. Uh, this is a future event that I mentioned earlier. This beast is alive. It was given breath and it spoke. Worship the beast or die. This is the same directive as was given to, to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Future events will repeat the past and our faith will be tested. So the challenge is simple. Worship the image of the beast and be given the mark of, or die. There has been much said about the mark of the beast and speculation about what that mark might be. We'll talk about that when we get to that chapter. Yes, we will. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's uh, that's our uh, our uh, little uh, trailer there for you. <laughs> yeah. It's a teaser. It's a teaser. Hold on. <laughs> okay, uh, Daniel three twelve through thirteen. Uh, who would like to read that for us, please? I'll do that. There are certain Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not paid due regard to you. They do not serve your gods or worship <laughs> the gold image which you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in rage and fury, he's not, he's not used to people not doing what he says, is he? Mm -hmm. In rage and fury, gave the command to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So they brought these men before the king. And those <laughs> Chaldeans, oh, those <laughs> Chaldeans. And of course, See, the king is angry when they have disobeyed his directive. And now we've got uh, 3, 14 through 15. Hey, one last thing on uh, that last one. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> we've got a, we've got fakers. Now we have tattletellers, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so in, I think it's Daniel chapter 6. These uh, maybe the same tattletellers tell do a telling on uh, Daniel. Yeah. Remember when he prayed and he gets thrown into a lion's den. So yeah. there's little connection here. Yes, there is. A little sophistry in the Chaldeans, yeah. Yes. Well, I'll go ahead and read this one. There are certain Jews whom have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not paid due regard to you. They do not serve your guards, gods or worship the gold image which you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar in rage and fury gave the command to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So they brought these men before the king. Oh, and we'd already read that one. Harley just read that one. Yeah, yeah. But, but, but you did it so much better. It sounds oh, like yeah. Yeah, that was... well, you know, it, it bears repeating, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, Daniel 3, 14 and 15, Nebuchadnezzar uh, spoke saying to them, is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the gold image, which I have set up? Now, if you are ready at the time you hear the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, and psaltery, in symphony with all kinds of music, and you fall down and worship the image which I have made, good. But if you do not worship, you shall be cast immediately in the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And who's the God who will deliver you from my hands? Hmm. There's a challenge we can set forth, right? Uh, a there's challenge. a challenge. How quickly they forget. <laughs> yeah. he's, he's challenging God in this yeah. case. He's basically saying, who's God, me or your God? Yes, that's right. He's forgotten from 23 years before. Yeah. It's almost As... like he's, lost, he's left God completely, the true God. Yeah. So As a side note... Uh -huh. It's interesting as a musician that the horn, flute, harp, lyre, and psaltery in the symphony of all kinds of music you fall down is repeated at least three times. Yes. Yeah. It yeah. Is. And there was now a, why? Yeah. You know, now why? That's the question. It bears repeating. <laughs> <laughs> is it important to God that we that He accepts all these instruments? and music within his sanctuary you know i was i was thinking about this uh as far as the systems of false worship and oftentimes they have some grandiose things going on right 
you'll see huge statues or grandiose buildings or and then they'll have huge musical presentations going on with them and all these things are to inspire awe and so I'm, I'm imagining that's what this is all about it's it's not only those instruments but it's all kinds of music this is all there built up to inspire you to have this awe feeling and bow down right and that's what I'm sort of seeing here. I'm not sure if that's it, but that's the sort of I was that, I was sort of thinking about the same thing you were, darling, about why was that there? And yeah. I think this is a false a false a false religion trick. It's a, it's a good question too. As opposed to the still small voice, you know. Yes. The king But in like the Old that. Testament, they they always had the the lead group and then they had the group uh, playing instruments before they went into battle or went on a, an event. Well, like, yeah, I grew, and they're traveling through the wilderness or going to attack someone when they got into Canaan. You notice that this wasn't yeah. really music that was meant to be enjoyed. It was actually like the dropping of a flag in a race. In other words, when you hear all this noise, <laughs> And, you know, you got a lot of different instruments here and with all kinds of music. So, I mean, this is uh, almost like heavy metal, uh, psychedelic almost mm -hmm. in my mind. That was the start of, okay, you hear this, now fall down and worship. Mm -hmm. It yep. wasn't worship music. It was uh, a signal type of music, at least what I can see from the context of this. Yeah. Like not, not, not that it trumpet. matters much, but you're right. There is a beginning thing, but... You know, as they bring up the symphony and symphony with everything else. So I, I don't think it's a cacophony. Yeah. I, I do think the music is planned out as well as the statue is all planned out to inspire worship. Right. Well, yeah. let's not miss the, the main point of this. That's, that's yeah, Which, this is, the, this is yeah, the, the main point. The main point is, right? <laughs> is worship uh, falling down to this false god and being. So the real commandment here is the commandment not to uh, worship. But I, God's, I yeah. think this is an example and how he would like us to worship. Well, actually, again, we're, this isn't about worship to God. It's about worship to a false God. Right. So uh, but, you, you see what I'm saying? Uh, yeah, I see the, what you're saying. Yeah. So uh, worship to God. You know, we, we know that God, uh, especially in the Psalms, is a lot of music and instruments, etc., I think God accepts that, uh, you know, within the holiness that he is due him. But again, the, the, the purpose of this here is really the, the worship of false gods. And um, I think that comes up in your next slide, uh, Larry. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure. Um, well, one thing I wanted to say here, though, is that, uh, you know, the king whose kingdom was over through Israel is thinking, you know, I overthrew Israel and uh, I brought these uh, people back cap captive to Babylon. So who's going to actually protect them uh, from this situation? Sinful men stand in judgment over God and question his decrees. They imagine themselves to be more clever than God, thinking they can outwit God. This is becoming more prevalent in our culture today. Many blatantly thumb their noses and curse God. So once again, reflecting back to the previous chapter of Daniel, we now see that Nebuchadnezzar only paid lip service to the power of the Hebrew God. And who is the God who will deliver you from my hands? Who would like to read this one? Shadrach, okay, go ahead. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. Amen. Challenge <laughs> accepted. The three give a faithful statement that says God, the God they serve, has the ability to serve us from this fiery furnace. Yeah, notice, notice how resolute they are. They, yeah. they truly purposed in their heart that uh, like years before that they weren't going to eat the, the king's food uh, and dishonor God. And here they purpose in their heart, we're not going to bow down to any God that you've set up. Yeah, that's right. 
Now, but if, if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you've set up. So these three faithful men refused to compromise, even at the risk of losing their lives. So as we can see from the words, but if not, their conviction didn't come from a promise that God was going to deliver them, did it? Mm -mm. Yeah, their statements came from strong faith in God. They lived by faith and they were prepared to die in faith. We too are called to be faithful in the face of death, even. Neither do we have a promise of deliverance from the hands of ungodly men. Stephen was martyred, and the 11 original apostles and millions of other faithful became martyrs. Maybe that was only 10, because was John a martyr? I think John died of natural causes, didn't he? Yeah, but he was really, that he, was, he was boiled and didn't die. So oh, guess... that's true. <laughs> Good point. Yeah. So there's an example of uh, saved by faith. They were willing to obey God regardless of the circumstances, traditions, or peer pressures. What words come to mind when I read of their response? Obedience. That's God's command. God's command is specific, and they would not be tempted to deviate. They feared God above anything men could do to them. The second, of course, is faith. They believed God's promises. And the third is that in Deuteronomy, 31 6 Isaiah and uh, Isaiah 41 10 we're going to see these now so what's he say the Lord your God who goes with you he will not leave leave you or forsake you and of course here in Isaiah 41 10 fear not for I am with you be not dismayed for I am your God I will strengthen you I will help you I will uphold you with my righteous right hand and then Second Thessalonians. But the Lord is faithful. He will establish you and guard you against the evil one. So we have plenty of promises of God if we're faithful. And they did as well, those three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So now we hear, here we are at uh, uh, the king is furious and things are going to get real hot real quick. Who wants to read this one? <laughs> <laughs> Angela, you were about to read. Uh, then Nebuchadnezzar was full of fury, and the expression on his face changed toward Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He spoke and commanded that they heat the furnace seven times more than it usually than it usually heated. And he commanded certain mighty men of valor who were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. Then these men were bound up <clears throat> in their coats, their trousers, their turbans, and their other garments and were cast in the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Thank you, Angela. So the king has them tied up. The soldiers tie them up and throw them in that fiery furnace. Notice that the king's, the face of the king changed towards the three. So uh, he's got a scowl on his face, perhaps. I don't know. Perhaps he noticed that they were not afraid and remained calm in their firmness not to obey his command. I don't know. But it is written there that his face changed towards Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The furnace was heated seven times more than usual. Why seven? What's the significance of that? God likes that number. God likes that number. Barbara said God likes that number. You're right, because it's it's mentioned seven in the Bible over 700 times, so God must like that number. Seven is the number of completeness or perfection. It's It was heated as high as it could be heated, is what he's really saying here. And we're going to see those... Uh, hey, Charlie's got a visitor. We're going to see those uh, that those numbers numbers talked about further in prophecy. Okay. Who would like to read this? About five or ten minutes. Okay. okay. Therefore, because the king's command was urgent and the furnace exceedingly hot, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. 
And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down bound in the midst of the fiery furnace. Never noticed this before, but they were actually bound when they were thrown in there. Yeah, tied up. So they, they were probably tied. landed on their face, you know. Yeah. Didn't have anything to stop them from falling. But the strong men, the, the strong men have died. These these soldiers have died from throwing them in the fiery furnace. And then it was hot. Made, say again. It was hot. It was hot, that's for sure. <laughs> then Kim, Kim, I thought I thought it was interesting that these men had valor. They weren't just any soldier. No. They were soldiers yes. that yeah. he really felt highly respect to. And he killed them. Yeah, that's right. Basically. The valor is the, they were successful on the battlefield. And, and yeah. those valorous soldiers are the ones that threw them in and they died. So there was not... You know, these were men that he knew could succeed in making this happen. Right. So then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and he rose in haste and spoke, saying to his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound in the midst of the fire? They answered and said to the king, True, O king. Whoa, am I seeing things? Is what he's really saying. They were thrown into the fire, right? Look. He answered, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire and they are not hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the son of God. Wow. So the three are thrown into the furnace that is heated to its maximum capacity. And as the king and others watch, they can see not three, but four men in the furnace walking around. And one of the fourth is like the son of God, the son of God. Isn't that one of the names reserved for Jesus? Mm -hmm. Amen. Question it is. But but Jesus wasn't yet born. So so who was it? Let's look at Gen, uh, Genesis 1, 26 and John chapter 8. Genesis 1, 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have a dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And I highlighted, although it's not real easy to see probably, that let us, our, is twice, and there is only one God. So who is us? Jesus. Trinity, yeah. Ghost. God in three persons, huh? So, and Jesus, uh, yeah, in John 8, 57 and 58, and it could be John 1, we see something similar, similar wording. Then the Jews said to him, you are not yet 50 years old, and you have seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. So, the Son of Man, also in the fiery furnace with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now in John 3, 26 and 27, would someone read that for us? I'll read it. Just before we jump in there, uh -huh. I, I just I just find this incredible that whenever we are in any particular uh, uh, challenge or faith, temptation, whatever, Jesus jumps in there with us. You know? yeah. So these Good. guys were in the, in the burning fire, Jesus jumped in there with them. I'll um, never so, leave you nor forsake yeah. you. So, that was a quote uh, in Deuteronomy. Yeah. Uh, it's also quoted by Jesus. Yeah. 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 Good. Never think that you're abandoned, even though everything looks terrible. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, uh, well, I'll read this one then. Then Nebuchadnezzar was uh, went near the mouth of the fire, burning fiery furnace, and spoke, saying, "Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out and come here." Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came from the midst of the fire, and the satraps, administrators, governors, and the king's counselors gathered together, and they saw these men on whose body the fire had no power. The hair of their head was not singed, nor were their garments affected, and the smell of fire was not on them. So he acknowledges God, calling him the most high God. He is saying that their God is above all others very similar to what he said at the end of two. 
Can you imagine the look on the faces of the king and the government officials? They saw <laughs> a miracle of miracles. How could these men have survived this fire? The three were not affected by the fire at all. I mean, not even their hair was singed. They didn't even smell like smoke. Right. Wow. You know, I, I think that's a, a last day sort of scenario for us too. We see that when God's people are under attack, that somehow when it looks bad, they won't even be singed. <laughs> Everybody be astonished. But go ahead. Uh, yeah, another, good point. Little side comment. <laughs> Uh, Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel and delivered his servant, servants who trusted in him, and they would have frustrated the king's word and yielded their bodies, that they should not serve nor worship any, any god except their own god. Therefore, I make a decree that any people, nation, or language which speaks anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces, and their houses shall be made an ash heap, because there is no other God who can deliver it like this. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. So there's a reward for those who are faithful to God. Mm -hmm. He brings it with him. Yeah, you know, it's the, the surprising thing, and you may bring this out, Larry, but uh, it's like Nebuchadnezzar's not learned his lesson still yet. He's making he's making a decree. He's going to cut people up, yeah. burn their oh, houses. <laughs> he's still into this punishment thing uh, regarding religion, you know. Yeah. So it, it, it amazes me. In fact, in the next chapter of four, we'll see where uh, evidently King Nebuchadnezzar finally learns his lesson. Yeah. Well, he remembered it. A little bit of it when he saw four in the fiery furnace and saw that uh, the fourth person was like the son of God. So he remembered a little. Yeah. Yeah, a yeah little absolutely. Yeah, so, that's right. Yeah. And then yeah, uh, for, God, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And behold, I am coming quickly. And my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. That, of course, coming from Revelation 22, 12. Right. And then uh, Daniel 4, did you want to kind of mention what we're going to see, Eddie? No, since uh, Charlie doesn't help me out. <laughs> I understand, Charlie, no problem. <laughs> yeah, next week we're going, to see, we're going to see that the king has yet another dream many years after that uh, first one. And uh, the magicians can't interpret the dream again. How about that? Those fakers at it <laughs> again. So what do they do? They call for Daniel, which who they should have called to begin with. This time Daniel's alone. It's possible that maybe even uh, his friends passed on, or I don't know, just may not have been around. But and Daniel explains the dream, and uh, and it's not a very good dream for the king. Uh, this one's really bad because they, God shows him a tree. That tree is a symbol of uh, Dan or Nebuchadnezzar. But guess what happens? <laughs> He's chopped down and his life is changed uh, dramatically. And uh, the king will learn his lesson, though, from, from this dream. It also has some lessons for us, as do all of these. Yeah. So I'll try to bring those out as we talk next week. Good. Well, good. Uh, that concludes Daniel chapter three. And uh, Eddie, would you be willing to close us in prayer? Sure. Uh, Heavenly Father, um, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God who um, foretold hundreds and thousands of years ago what would happen in the days of these kings. You've told us over and over repeatedly, Lord, that uh, you have great love for us and that you desire to pull back the curtain of the future that we might see and that it might inspire us and be prepared for the soon return of Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray a blessing on all that have heard this or that will hear it, that the Spirit of God might move upon each one of our hearts and that we too might 
purpose in our heart not to do anything that would dishonor you. We thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you for Jesus, his death on the cross, his resurrection, and for being our meteor, medi mediator in heaven this day. Bless each one of us as we go our way. Give us a good night's sleep, and may our dreams be sweet. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thanks, Eddie. Thanks, everyone, for coming. And uh, we thank hope you, Larry. To see you again next week. Thank you, Larry. You're welcome. Very good job, Larry. See you later, buddy. Appreciate Thank it, you. Larry. Bye, everybody. See you next Bye. week. Bye. Bye.